this is heavy. So... I don't know what the thumbnail looked like because this is I'm gonna fuck up my wrist, but we're we're discussing this. Roll the intro. Let's discuss. I talked about a lot of these. I talked about uh, from Assassin's Blade through Queen of Shadows already in my November wrap up, so I feel like. I don't really need to go into them here. I talked about them. They existed. Um, but it's, getting these out is also a pain in the ass. So like the fact that I'm doing this, y'all know that I love you. Let's zoom in because I'm the star here. Um, so this is really going to focus on, on these three lovely installments, starting with Empire of Storms, which is the first, the first, the official, like, fifth book in the series. It was the sixth one that I read, because again, Assassin's Blade was in the mix. And this book left me, left me gutted, um, really, the way that this book ended. I was not, I was not prepared for how things ended here. I'm ju I just know as I'm going to do a brief little overview. I didn't explain this very well. I'm going to do a brief little overview of my thoughts on each one of these. I have like full Goodreads things going on. I'll try to leave those down in the description. I'll try to remember to do that. I will try to be a good booktuber person. Um, but overall, Empire of Storms, you know, we are right after the explosion of the Glass Castle. Everything that went down in Queen of Shadows. That book, I think, is like probably the pinnacle of the series. It was also a point in the series where there were still quite a few characters, like the same amount of characters really were in Queen of Shadows that end up in these next, in this trio of books we're going to be talking about today. But I think that the characters were handled better there. It just, there was something about the cohesion element that was, it was beautiful in Queen of Shadows that was kind, kind of absent for being honest here from some of these later works. I still, really enjoyed Empire of Storms. I, it, like I said, it left me gutted. I am, I will never be the same person I was before I read Empire of Storms. It just won't happen. Then we got to like my favorite book in this, I don't know, was it my favorite? Maybe. We got to Tower of Dawn, which was the book that I was the most interested to get to when I started this little journey. Because I knew it was Kale's book. I knew we were gonna go back to, not Kale, Kaol. His name is Kayal. Like, that's what the pronunciation guide says. I listened to the audiobook for like three seconds before I returned it. His name is Kayal. So, Mr. Kayal, he was out here. Nesrin, love Nesrin. Irene, Irene Towers, that's my girl. In a lot of ways, Tower of Dawn reminded me of Assassin's Blade. They kind of echo each other, so I think it's really fitting that they're both this lovely little blue color. Um, and this was originally supposed to be a novella. I think some people still call it a novella because we don't follow Aelin. But I think that Aelin forfeited the like main character role a long time ago. But also, as we will all remember, Kayal was definitely a point of view character in Throne of Glass. So I'm out here calling it's a novel. It's not a novella. It's not a collection of little trinkets. It was a full blown story and it was I think it was really interesting. One, because we got to see a completely different area of the world. I know that a lot of people are like, oh, Sarah J. Mass threw like all her people of color into this one book. And like, I guess because you know, Nehemia, may she rest in peace. I don't know. I just, I don't think, I think the way it was executed, it worked well for me. And again, Irene, who is one of my favorite things about the Assassin's Blade, I was nice, I was happy to see her again, doing her healing, doing her learning. Um, it was just really great. And this book, I think, much like Assassin's Blade, can't be skipped. I don't know how people are skipping this. Um, not only does it tie in, like, it, it does bring back some of those elements that the Assassin's Blade had. Um, but it, it just, I don't understand how you would, the plot twists in this were crazy. The, the reveals in this were crazy. Stuff was happening on the southern continent. It wasn't like, oh, they went on this journey. No. Very important happenings happened here. So I loved this one. I gave it five out of five stars. And then we get to the concluding volume, Kingdom of Ash, which is going to be the longest book that I've read this year. 
none of the other books that I'm planning to read before the end, like the year's over, uh, top this in terms of page count. So I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> we'll get into that in later in my best and worst books. But as for Kingdom of Ash, objectively, this is probably a five star book. Like objectively speaking, it probably is. But for me, when I'm looking at it in comparison to the rest of the series, it just, it, there was something about it that was, it wasn't there. Like it connected all of the threads. It did all of the things it needed to do, but there was something about Kingdom of Ash. And this book almost made me cry. Like I was on the verge, I am never on the verge of tears. Kingdom of Ash got me to the verge of tears and still I cannot sit here and be like five stars because there was just something about this book that felt like it was missing which again is crazy because it's 984 pages so like what could possibly be missing and as for the page count I don't think that there's a lot of things I would trim from this and I like to think even though I have over the course of this read reading experience become something of a Sarah J Mass stand we are out here simping for Sarah I started off 2020 being like, Sarah, House of Earth and Blood, we could chop some pages. Like, and I still feel that way. So I don't think I can, I don't think I look at a Sarah J Mass book and it's like, everything you write is perfect. I'm like, we can still make, we can make some cuts. But here, I don't think I would. I don't think I would. And so I think with that kind of all said, I want to go into an overall discussion of this series because I don't know if talking about a series like these last three installments individually really makes sense. So as I try to fit this back in here, I think that my biggest complaint, there are two that I have with this series construction. And they're more character than they are plot or like execution. Because even though I think that a lot of the execution of Kingdom of Ash, like there isn't a ton of character deaths like most of the people all of the people make it out of the book alive that wasn't my complaint my complaint more was about two specific characters in particular dorian holivard and manon blackbeak of the iron teeth cochran queen whatever we're calling her i i felt let down and disappointed i think that queen of shadows sets up this really great arc for Dorian that Sarah J Mass just, it doesn't materialize for him. You know, in Queen of Shadows, we have our boy Dorian out here imprisoned in his own mind. He's being used by the Vogue. His father is, he thinks that his father is like doing all this like crazy shit, you know. His father's always been doing crazy shit. Then they kind of like try to paint like genocide as a good thing. That was a mo that was a weird little moment. Again, I don't think Sarah was out here doing revolutionary work that we can't critique. But there's something about Dorian's storyline there where he is being imprisoned in his own mind, like I said. He is being used by the Vogue. His father is, like, doing crazy shit. And Dorian is, like, just trapped in there while all this stuff is happening to him. And then he has to, like, kill his father at the end of the book. Like, that was a lot. Like, that's a, that was a lot. Like, he has to be there in the room, and his best friend is there, and his best friend becomes, like, paralyzed because of the actions. Like, a lot of trauma happens to Dorian very specifically in a very short period of time because the whole book is really only the course of, like, a year and a half. Selena starts the story at 18. We end it. She's, like, 20. So it's not a lot of time in this world that we spend here. Um, I mean, I guess it's a little bit longer if we count like the Assassin's Blade, like we get like a glimpse into that window, but Dorian specifically, his trauma is very compacted into a very small window. And the way that people talk about Miss Sarah and how she handles like grief and loss, and I felt like that was all just kind of, I don't know if I would use the word minimize, but it just did not materialize for me in the way that I think that it should have. Um, particularly because Dorian was a point of view character who continued to travel with the crew and then even when he went on a mission to receive or like to to find and locate the other word keys it didn't he didn't do it like it didn't materialize for me the way that I think that it should have or could have and I was like this is weird and instead what we kind of got was like all of the reasons why uh, the King of Adderland was actually a good person and like we said he was trying to like 
they use genocide as like a good thing, which you'll never convince me that a ruler committing genocide against his like against a group of people is going to be for the greater good. Like you just aren't gonna sell me on that. I don't care who you are. So that was out of the picture from jump pretty much. And then in specifically in Kingdom of Ash, we have like this whole thing about how Doreen was named after his father and his father was constantly fighting Erewhon and it was just a lot that it didn't work for me. And then I think on the op, like, so instead of like setting up this beautiful trauma arc and having them see them, even I don't think uh, Aelin, when she was imprisoned by Maeve and she was like locked in iron and she couldn't move and she was in this box for a significant portion of Kingdom of Ash, at least a couple hundred pages we spent with her in this iron box, like locked away. Um, compounded, you know, against all those previous things that happened to her that we know about, like the salt mines and things. Again, I don't think her trauma arc really materialized, like it didn't really happen. But the other character, like I said, was Manon Blackbeak, which, let me cut the tape so we can keep talking. So Manon Blackbeak, she was in a significant chunk of the story, starting with Air of Fire. And while from like Air of Fire to Queen of Shadows, there was that arc of her leaving her grandmother and like embarking on her own and like finding, finding herself. For me, it was always really hard to see like what had motivated that spark within her that couldn't be explained away by Croc and Blood. Like it was kind of explained like, oh, she's doing these things because she's not a full iron tooth, which she, her mother was the Cochrane Queen. And so because the goody goody Cochrane blood is inside of Manon, like she was kind of predisposed to like, at some point rebel, which didn't make any sense because she was doing really well with the iron teeth. Like, yes, her mother, like her grandma was like really intense and she was, you know, constantly belitting, like belitting, belittling Manon and wanting Manon to prove herself and like doing all of these things to get Manon to, to prove herself, it was never like, oh, you're going to like, you're gonna rebel and like, you're not going to do these things. I mean, I know that her grandma like tried to kill Asterin and like, I guess that was kind of like a little too much for Manon. She was like, nah, you're not killing my second. But there was just something about her storyline and like why she eventually came to be on Aelin Galathinius' side, which was really just odd to me. I don't think I ever really believed it. Like once they were on the same side, I could I could kind of like, okay, this is what we're going with. But there was something about like the number of pages Manon was given, which is substantial again, because she appears in Air of Fire for the first time and she, we don't ever not get Manon chap. Well, I guess technically like Crown of, uh, not Crown of, uh, Tower of Dawn. She's clearly not there because she's off doing her thing uh, in the in the north. But in the books, we do get Manon chapters because she's a featured character. There's, I just didn't, I didn't, be, I didn't believe it. Like I didn't believe that she would actually do, like to, to do these things. And her aesthetic was cool, and her relationship with Dorian was kind of, it was kind of there. But I, th I did think that it was very telling that in Kingdom of Ash particularly, after, you know, he and Aelin are trying to forge the lock and they go into this mission thinking they're both going to die. Um, and then, you know, Aelin kicks him out and she's like, no, you're gonna live. Um, after all of that and everyone's like locked away, like, and even after they're locked away at the end, after Maeve and Erewhon are actually defeated, defeated, the first thing Homeboy wants is Kaol. Like, the way that the Sarah Jane, like, I did not go into this series expecting queerness because this is still from the era where everyone says that her books are painfully heterosexual. And again, she did, she did, you know, catch me slipping. Did catch me slipping with, with uh, House of Earth and Blood. Danica Bryce forever, but Kale, Kale, Dorian, they're clearly, they're clearly, I'm sorry, like, I love Irene, like, Irene, that's my girl, that's, that's my girl, but non, I don't really care about, I'm very indifferent to her, I think that she had a lot of page time, but she was just, like, the cool girl in the back who just looked cool, um, and again, it's not that she didn't, 
um, add things to the story. Like, she very clearly was important. The, the book could not have, the story could not have played out the way that it did if not for Manon. Um, but still, uh, Kaol and Dorian, like, you're just not going to convince me they, they aren't fucking. It's just, you aren't going to convince me of that. It's fine. I've accepted it. I hope you've accepted it so we can all move on together. I also think that Queen of Shadows was kind of the pinnacle because it, not only did it feel like a nice little conclusion, even though it was very clearly a moment of rest before everything hit the fan, and again, Empire of Storms, Kingdom of Ash, Tower of Dawn, shit hit the fan. Like, it wasn't like, oh, Queen of Shadows was like the peak. No. There were definitely higher highs, but there just wasn't that same sense of satisfaction in the ultimate conclusion. But also, after Queen of Shadows, the relationship between Adian and Aelin kind of like fell off, and that was very sad for me a little bit because I did really enjoy the Adian. Aelin dynamic in Air of Fire and Queen of Shadows. I felt that, that was kind of like the, the the heart and soul of the book. And as the series progressed, um, we did kind of just get more uh, romance arcs. Um, and, it, and even in Tower of Dawn, like it was still satisfying if I, you know, ignored the fact that Kaol and Irene were low-key, low-key adultery like Loki cheating but at the same time Nesrin and Sartok again that was also just kind of weird to me like I don't know if I actually believe that one as much as I believe that Kaol and, 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 and Irene that I think was really serious focus and then Nesrin and Sartok were just kind of like a coupling to excuse uh Kaol and and Irene to, so they can get together. I never really got on board with Rowan and Aelin, cousin fuckers, love that for them. I don't care how many times Miss Sarah tries to tell me that they're very, you know, distant cousins, cousin fuckers, a cousin fucker to me. Uh, so I love that for them, but it's not my, it's not my personal taste. But overall, I really enjoyed this. I know that this is a very popular series. I know there are many a salty opinion out there on the interwebs about them. Many a booktuber has done a rantish discussion of Throne of Glass. But for me, purse, I don't know how Sarah could top this. Um, I, I still have to finish the Court of Thorns and Roses series. I will be continuing that in the new year. Uh, I don't know when the next ha Carson City book is coming out, but I will continue there. But this, this series, I just think it hit even though the romance didn't always hit for me, I do think it was the best executed. I felt that even though I personally didn't ship it, except for Sam. Sam is a love interest that never needed to exist. So I'm really happy that like, I think she had like some Sam related tattoos. I'm happy those got erased in Kingdom of Ash. That made me a little bit happy. But overall, I think that from the romance to the familial dynamics to the overarching plot, Sarah said it and I, I also would like to to go back to a thought that I had in that November wrap-up where I said that kind of Throne of Glass was a disconnect for me because I do think that a lot of people say with Air of Fire the series kind of takes a sharp right turn and that kind of put me off of reading the series for a really long time and I and I don't know if I agree with that I don't think that there was really a point in the story where it wasn't like something I'd already Read. I do think that there is a, a very well thought out through line from Throne of Glass through to Kingdom of Ash. It doesn't feel as abrupt as I felt that maybe some people on booktube who didn't really care for the story like the series made me think it was going to be. I do think that again it was very well executed. I don't know how Mass is going to top this but I'm very much looking forward to continuing with Mass's back uh, her backlist and her front list, because again, we know I do have A Court of Silver Flames on pre-order. We are, we are, like, we are head first into the Mass universe. So I am a Sarah J Mass stan now. This is a Sarah J Mass simp account, specifically for the Throne of Glass books. I will defend these, which was not something I saw coming. Overall, at the beginning of the year, after I read A House of Earth and Blood, I thought maybe Sarah J Mass would be the author that I did a kind of Cassie Clare thing that I, like in 2019, I tried to read all of Cassandra Clare's uh, Shadowhunter books and I didn't quite manage to do that. I did not get to Queen of Air and Darkness, but 
Sarah J Mass was the next kind of booktube staple backlist person that I wanted to get to. And unlike Cassandra, I am actually at this point very invigorated to continue and I'm looking forward to more Sarah J Mass books. Uh, and I'm just kind of over Cassie. So I appreciated this little experiment. I love this little marathon that I did. It wasn't planned, very impromptu. If I had thought it out better, might have vlogged it, but you live and you let live. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far into the video, make sure you leave this emoji down in the comment section and I'll see you guys soon with another video. But until then, and until next time.